Good morning, church family. How are you guys doing? Like Pastor Josh said, my name is Mandy, and I have the joy and privilege to be the youth pastor here. Um, I absolutely love my job, and it does not feel like a job at all, which is the best kind of job to have. So students, get that kind of job. It doesn't feel like a job. Happy Mother's Day. All you uh, amazing moms out there, I'm so glad that you guys are here. You could be sleeping in, which might be what I would choose to do if it was my day to celebrate myself. That sounds like a good nap day. I love napping, guys. I'll probably take a nap this afternoon, let's be real. So happy Mother's Day. I'm glad you guys are here. It's a joy and a privilege to celebrate you guys all this morning. Moms, as a parent, I'm sure you know this, but you have a very difficult job. Firstly, keep the tiny humans alive, which if your kids are grown, you did it. You did it. Proud of you all. If not, you're almost there. You're doing a good job. Keep it up. Keep it up. Secondly, do everything possible to make sure that they turn out to be a good egg, not a bad egg, right? Hard job. You guys have a hard job. I do not envy you at all, but thank you so much for everything that you do for your kids. So every person in this room, whether you bear the title of mom or not, you all represent a different story. You all represent a different story of what kind of mom you had. Maybe you have the stay-at-home mom who is there for every single thing. Uh, maybe they're super, super involved, sometimes maybe overly involved, like I think there's a loving term called helicopter mom, right? So maybe you had that kind of mom. Maybe you had a mom who was working really hard. She worked a nine-to-five job and was there as much as possible, but they had a job. Maybe you had a traveling mom who was gone a lot. Maybe you had a single mom, which, oh my gosh, single moms, you guys are my heroes. You do so much, so many roles you take. Maybe you had a mom who was more negligent, where most of the time they were checked out and it felt like you had to do a lot of growing up when you should have been still a kid. Maybe you had no mom. Everyone in this room has a different story of what their mom was like. And based on our upbringing, we have different ideas on what a mom should be like. So this is mine. I want to take a moment to say hi, Mom, because she's watching right now. She's living in Idaho right now, so she can't be here in person, but she's watching live. So hi, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. When else am I going to get to do that, right? So my mom is incredible. She is the one that I would call for help. She still is. I live four minutes away from here, and I call her on my drive home sometimes. It's a great hi, oh, I'm home, bye situation, but that's what my mom would do with her mom, is just talk all the time um, on drives. So I do that with my mom. She was the one who would shake me awake every morning, so I would get to school on time. I would be so late without her. And on the days where I was late, God bless my mother, she had pre-written late notes for me. <laughs> so all she had to do was date it, as I flew out the door on my way into school. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things. Mom, I need the notes. It's great, it's great. <laughs> she would play with me. She would read with me. She was the one who taught me how to love reading. She taught me how to love church, how to love the Lord. She would show up to every single performance I would do, no matter how many times she had seen it. My mom watched first service, and she's watching again today. It's the same message, guys. <laughs> but she's still watching because that's who my mom is. She was also the one who organized our family times, our family get-togethers, to make sure we had the adequate amount of family time. And I didn't realize this until she had moved, that she was one of the people that had kept our family Christmas parties together, which they don't happen anymore because my mom's not here to make sure it happens. It's crazy how you don't realize how much your mom does. 
to moms and those of you with hearts of a mom, today is the day we get to honor you guys. So thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do. You guys are leaving a legacy. So legacy, what is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you never get to see. It's a quote from Hamilton. <laughs> Got to give credit where credit's due. But here's what it's saying is that we don't truly know our legacy until we are no longer around to hear it, which is unfortunate. Some of you might be having a hard Mother's Day today because your mom is no longer around to celebrate it. And maybe that's a reminder like, oh, Mother's Day, my mom's not here. Maybe you're like me, where your mom's still around, but she lives a distance away and you can't actually have the same kind of celebration as you did with a kid, Sunday after church outings, lunches, going shopping with mom, you know, all those fun things you get to do on Mother's Day when your mom's present. So Mother's Day is always bittersweet because I can celebrate my mom, even though it's virtual now, but I can still celebrate her, but my mom can't celebrate her mom. About 14 years ago, my grandma passed away, so today I want to remember the legacy that she left for me and my family. She left a legacy of the importance of church. She was the classic church-going grandma where she would be so deeply involved in, like, everything. She did her Bible study, small groups, everything. She really taught us the importance of being at church, and not just on Sundays, but deeply involved in the community at church. She taught us the importance of family, of spending every holiday together, hence my mom carrying on that legacy of family time. She taught us the importance of education. My grandma valued education so much, and she knew that it was important for her grandkids to attend college and have the opportunity to have a deeper education. So before she passed, she set up funds for each of us grandkids to go to college, and that is why I'm able to stand here today as an educated woman because of grandma. So thank you so much, grandma, for everything you did for that. Grandmas are amazing. She also passed on her love for In-N-Out. It's amazing. My, uh, you guys get to hear this one. We have this loving term for the grandma. So whenever we would have In-N-Out or something delicious, my grandma would do the grandma, which is like, ooh. She would get excited. So whenever we're like, we're going to In-N-Out, she's like, ooh. It's amazing. And then she also left us a physical legacy of her love for Kincaid. Thomas Kincaid is an artist who did a lot of paintings. And this is a painting that we have in our home. Greg and I have this in our home. This is a non-traditional Thomas Kincaid painting because it's one of his Disney collection pieces, which I love more because I love Disney kind of like my grandma and me combine into this painting is basically what's happening. So one of the fun things I want to share with you guys about this painting is Thomas Kincaid loved to hide things in his paintings. So if you zoom in on the bridge over on the left, you can see little Pinocchio looking off in the distance. So cute, so cute. What's he have to do with Beauty of the Beast? Nothing. He's just a little Easter egg. All right, and then if you zoom in on the little flower pot, we have the little mice from Cinderella. So cute, so cute. You think Greg painted them? I don't know. He's good, but not that good. <laughs> Love you, honey. So this is a fun piece that my, my grandma left for, for us. Kincaid, her love of Kincaids. So this piece behind me is the Forest Chapel, and that was my grandma's favorite Kincaid painting. She had dozens of paintings around her house from him, and this was her favorite, which I think is so fitting because that leads into my next and last piece of her legacy I want to share with you this morning, and that's her fierce love for God. There was scripture and references to scripture all over her house. 
At a young age, I learned the Lord's Prayer and the Serenity Prayer just because she had them posted in her house before I even understood what on earth they meant. I knew them because she had them in her house. She prayed with us all of the time, and more importantly, she prayed for us. If there is anything going on in our week, even if it was just like, oh, I have a little math quiz, she would be praying for us. And that changes everything when you have someone praying fiercely over you. And of course, she loved her Bible. My mom now has her Bible, and it's so fun to see all of the little grandma handwriting notes and what stood out to her and what meant something to her. She passed on this legacy of fiercely loving God. So in your bulletin, I have a a question for you to write about someone who meant something to you. Just like my grandma left a legacy for me, think about a loved one who meant something to you. So I want to ask a question to everyone this morning, not just our amazing moms, is what legacy does God want you to leave? What story does God want you to tell? Our Bibles have amazing stories about tons of of moms. We have Mary, who left a legacy of Jesus, right? I feel like that tops everything. Probably shouldn't have started with that one. But Mary, and then we have Elizabeth. She prayed and prayed and prayed for a child. And it says that when she was advanced in years, she had a child. And that was about 60 years old, was the youngest that would be considered advanced in years. So she was a minimum of 60 years old, But she left the legacy of being a fierce prayer warrior and seeing that come to pass. So today I want to talk about the legacy of Naomi. So if you will turn with me to the book of Ruth. It is in the Old Testament, after Judges, which if you are following along in our Bible reading plan, we are reading in Judges this week, so it should be easy to find. But it's uh, like a four chapter book, so it's real short, easy to pass. So we are in the book of Ruth. All right, if you are there, say, yes, I'm there. Great, all right. Chapter one, verse one. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. There is a lot to unpack in this one little verse, so let's let's dive in. So backing up to the last sentence in Judges, so flip the page over. Judges 21, 25, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So picture In just this room, everyone just doing whatever they want to. We all have somewhat similar versions of right and wrong, but somewhat different as well, right? That would be chaotic. It would be very chaotic, especially if you're playing a game like we do in youth group, and you're like, no, this is fine. I'm like, no, you're wrong. I'm right. This is my rule. It would be chaotic, So this is the the times that they're living in. It's already a little bit chaotic. And then we add on top of that the second part, right after that that comma in chapter, or sorry, verse one. There was a famine in the land. How many of you guys are hungry? It's uh, 11.56. It's almost lunchtime. (laughs) How many of you guys get hangry? Yeah, if I talk too long, y'all are going to start getting hangry. Be like, Mandy, get off the stage so I can have lunch. (laughs) So much more relatable than the 9 o'clock service. So there is a famine in the land, a bunch of hangry people not knowing where they're going to get their next meal. Adds even more chaos. So this is where our story starts. Kind of a great place to start the story, right? So they moved to a country of Moab. So there's a famine, and normally in the Old Testament, 
The famines were a sign of the people of God turning from him. It was a way for God to get his people redirected back to him because it's a, I mean, it's a great idea. Like this would, in theory, should have worked. But it's like, okay, you need something, you turn to God, right? When do you most likely pray? When you're in times of need, right? So most people, when there's a famine, they would turn from their idols and they would then worship the true God. But instead, we see this family move. They were like, okay, there's no food here, but there's food over here. I will solve my problem instead of partnering with God to solve the problem. So it's already probably not the best way to handle this, but they are in a foreign country of Moab. So this is where we're at. Verse 3. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Verse 3, Naomi's a widow. That's a lot. A lot has happened. Now, as a widow, she would be dependent on her sons for provisions. Naomi already, as a woman, didn't have that much say, so now as a widow, it's even more of like a scary place to be because now she's like, okay, I'm dependent on my sons and whatever choices they make in life. So in these three verses, we already see the legacy that Naomi is leaving. So if you have your bulletin, I'm going to fill in the first three points for you. Naomi has strength in difficult times. The times of living in the judges era, the chaotic era already, and living through the famine. She has strength in difficult times. Strength through transition, leaving the culture, the religion, that she, the friends that she knew in Judah, and moving to Moab. It's a huge transition, and she has strength through it. Strength in sorrow, losing her husband. My husband's sitting right here in the front row, and he is... He means so much to me. I cannot imagine losing him. So Naomi has lost her husband, and she has strength through it. Now, the Bible doesn't explicitly say, oh, Naomi had strength in all these situations, but how do I know that that's true? It's because she kept pressing on. Because there's more to her story than that. Continuing on in verse 4, and we're talking about her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. This shouldn't sound like that big of a deal. Like, sure, they got married. Cool, they did. But it's a, it's a big deal because in the Old Testament, there was laws against marrying foreign women. So we see this in Deuteronomy 23.3, Ezra 9, and Nehemiah 13, for examples. So it was advised that Israelite men should not marry non-Israelite women. And this was not a race issue. It kind of rubbed me a weird way because it felt like a race issue. Like, why? But this is why. This is why it's a big deal. Because, remember, the Old Testament was a lot about finding the promised land, right? The land that God promised to his people, to the Israelites. And it becomes an issue if they marry outside of the Israelites because then it's an inheritance issue. Because if you marry someone non-Israelite and you have kids and you pass on and then you have land to distribute, is the land still the land of God or is it now a non-godly people land? That's where the issue in this area lies. So now, continuing on, after they had lived there about 10 years, both sons died, and Naomi was left without her sons and her husband. Wow. Tragedy strikes again. Five verses in, and we have this insane roller coaster of emotions. We have living in this chaotic time, hangry people, moving to a foreign place that you're so unfamiliar with. 
I feel like this is like if we just upped and moved to, I don't know, Europe. Totally different people, right? Totally different. You lose your husband. Tragic. Your sons get married. Super exciting, but also like, well, you shouldn't be marrying these people. So it's like a mixed emotions type event. And then we have both sons die. Crazy emotion of roller coasters. I can't imagine losing a husband, let alone losing a child, let alone losing both children. A parent should never bury a kid, let alone all of her kids. So this is where Naomi's at. She's left without her husband and her two sons. That's the part that gets me, this left without. There's a hole in Naomi now, a hole that she's probably trying to wrestle with. How can I fill this? But she also knows I have these two daughter-in-laws that I love because they've been living together for 10 years. But she knows that there's something that they need too. They need to be protected and they need to be safe because remember being a widow was a scary thing. But that was when she had her two sons to provide for her. Now it's even scarier because now there's no men in her life that will provide for her. So they are all three now at risk of starvation and poverty. It's a scary place to be. So even with this, we see that Naomi still has strength. And how do I know that? Because she kept pressing on. Continuing on in verse 6. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughter-in-laws, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. I love that they use the word home to refer to Judah and not Moab where they had been living together. Because Naomi knows that Judah is her home. She knows that Moab was not supposed to be where they were permanently, but that that was just a temporary placement. So she's going home. And I am sure that she could not be more excited about being around her culture, her, her family, her friends, her people. But Ruth and Orpah were going to be foreigners if they came with her. And she knew the laws about marrying Moabite women. And she knew if you guys come with me, you guys won't have a very good future. And it will be hard for you to find a husband. So she has a hard choice to make. But in verse 8, we see her say this. Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as, as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. In these verses, we see her demonstrate sacrificial love. That's the next blank, sacrificial love. She knew the difficult time that lay ahead for these women, and she didn't want that for them. She wanted something better for them. And she knew that the only way for them to have a better life was them to remarry, and they couldn't do that easily in her home. So she sent them back to their home of Moab. So imagine 10 years. 10 years is a long time to be around someone. And she loved them but she still wanted to put their needs first. So she demonstrated sacrificial love. That entire part was also a prayer, which demonstrates the importance of praying blessings over loved ones. Just like my grandma would pray blessings over me and my sister and my mom does over me, Naomi demonstrates that importance. 
So to summarize what happens next, there's kind of like this, no, I want to I stay with you, please, no. And then Orpah eventually, she's like, okay, I will go back to Moab and find a life there. But Ruth does something different. We're going to be picking up in verse 16. And these are some famous Ruth words. and I'm sure you can anticipate where I'm going with this. So Ruth replies, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Something was so compelling about Naomi that Ruth wanted to risk it all. She wanted to risk it all to be with Naomi. And I think that that is her faith. I think her faith, the faith of Naomi, was so compelling that that made Ruth want to risk it all. Because see, here's the thing, is that Ruth, being born in Moab, she would not have had God as her God. Her God would have been Chemosh, not the God of Israel. So when she says, your God will be my God, that is a big deal. She's having an identity shift. Something has changed in Ruth to where she wants that to be something that is a lasting change. Your God will be my God. This faith is the key point in Naomi's legacy. And this is why. Because Naomi's legacy directly affects the lineage of Jesus. So if you'll turn with me to the New Testament, book of Matthew, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. No better place to start. And this is actually kind of what most people, myself included at times, to be honest, We'll skip over because it's not very fun and exciting and it's a lot of words that you're like, this has no meaning to me, so I'm just going to skip over it. It's the genealogy of Jesus. Lots of names. How many of you guys actually like skip over the names and like numbers is hard to read too because it's a lot of names, right? But it's really exciting when you know who the names are and you recognize them. Super exciting. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. Don't worry, we will not read all the names. Please feel free to do so in your own time if you want to have an exciting, riveting read. But we're going to be starting in chapter 1, verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Do you guys remember Rahab? Pastor Mako talked about her in January. If you haven't seen her message on it, I advise you to watch it. It's really good. Continuing on, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Super exciting. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. I'm going to stop there. Ruth made it into the lineage of Jesus, the genealogy of Jesus. How cool is that? And just think of Naomi's part in that. Without Naomi, Ruth would not have had the faith that she had. She would have been in Moab worshiping Chemosh. Crazy, right? You think that Naomi knew that that was the effect that she would have? Probably not. So here's what we can get out of this. Whether you have the title mom, the name mom, or not, you are writing a legacy no matter how old, no matter how young you are, you are writing a legacy. And even though you don't have the say in what your final legacy will be, because remember, we don't really know what our legacy is until we're not around to hear it anymore, but you do have a say in the direction that your legacy goes. Because obviously, I'm not going to have a legacy of being a basketball player because I am sportically challenged and I can't do that. But this is what I hope that my legacy will include. I hope my legacy includes my faith in God just like Naomi's. I hope it includes having joy in every circumstance. 
And lastly, I hope it includes being fun. Just some people remembering how much fun my life was. So what I need to ask myself is, am I doing things today that's planting these seeds? I'm obviously not planting seeds to be a basketball player, right? But I hope that I'm doing some seeds with faith and joy and fun. Because remember, you are planting garden, planting seeds in a garden that you don't get to see. What kind of seeds are you planting? Are you planting beautiful sunflowers that are going to bring joy and radiate the earth? Are you planting vegetables, nourishing people? Or maybe you're planting tumbleweeds that aren't going to do much yet, and maybe your garden needs a little bit of tending. What seeds are you planting? What legacy does God want you to leave? Are you asking him? If you're not asking him, ask him. And if you are asking him, are you listening to him? Or are you nervous and you're like, oh, I don't know, that's a huge legacy. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I'm good. I'm good. Because imagine if Naomi knew what God wanted her to do and said, no, that's too much pressure to like pass my faith on to someone else. I'm good. I'm good. Ruth would not be in this genealogy. She would not have this part to play that she did. But because of Naomi, Naomi's faith legacy passes on to Ruth, who eventually makes it down to Jesus, and now it's made its way to you. Your legacy matters. Landon, if I could have you come on up, start coming on up. Your legacy matters. See, Naomi was not the main character in this story, and you know how I know that? Oh, I closed it. Dang it. Well, picture me holding this up unless I can find it really fast. Naomi's not the main character in this story, and I know that because it's not named after her. <laughs> Who's it named after? <laughs> Ruth. Yeah, it's named after Ruth. But Naomi's legacy affects all of us today. From being passed down from generation to generation to generation to affecting Jesus who affects all of us. Jesus is the reason that we are all in this room. Naomi's legacy mattered. So you might not feel like the main character in the story. But God is using your legacy. Your legacy matters. You never know how your legacy might affect the course of history. Let's pray. God, I thank you so, so much for Naomi and every single thing that she teaches us. God, I ask you to, to touch our hearts this morning to reveal what you want our legacy to be. If we're doing something right now that you don't want us to be leaving behind, God, I ask you that you walk with us as we stop. God, if we're doing something, or if we're not yet doing something, I ask that you walk beside us and give us the courage to say yes to you and the legacy that you want us to leave. Because you have already written our stories. You know what the best course for our lives is, God. And we want that. We want the best. We want to partner with you. So God, we thank you so much for the people in our lives that have left legacies. We thank you so much for the legacy that you are creating in our own life. In your name we pray, amen. If you guys would join me for worship for our last song. Cause you make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of dust.
one of the many legacies that Jesus left behind was the legacy that we get to partake in right now of communion together. Communion ties all of us together. All of our likenesses, all of our differences, we are one in Christ. So if you do not have your communion elements yet, I want to invite you to grab some. I think there's some in the back over there. Um, So we're going to partake in communion today. If you want to turn your attention over to this table, this picture of the Last Supper, that's the legacy that Jesus has left us. The legacy of being able to partake in communion, that ultimate family time, really. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. Wow, this is really challenging today. My goodness. Pastor Josh, I get it. I always look at him and be like, how is he having a struggle? I'm having a struggle. Just imagine that. There we go. Okay, got it. Jesus must have had some nails. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, yeah. And the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he turned to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. So take and eat in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you in remembrance of your sin. His blood cleanses you of all your sins so that you can have an amazing legacy. So take and drink in remembrance of him. So God, we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus for us so that we can be a part of this community. God, we thank you for the legacy that all of these These people in your word have left, Lord. So God, be with us this week. In your name we pray, amen. So may the Lord bless you. May he keep you and may he make his face shine upon you. Moms, may you have an incredible, blessed Mother's Day full of celebration, full of remembering those who have left legacies already and celebrating the legacy you are leaving yourselves. Happy Mother's Day and have an amazing week. We'll see you next week. Cause you-